In this video, we're going to learn about trees. A tree is simply a special kind of graph, and a graph is considered a tree if it is both connected and has no cycles. So you can see here that I have a tree, and it is connected, meaning each vertex is connected in some way to another vertex on our graph, and it has no cycles. And another way that we could say this is that there is a unique path from each vertex to another vertex. So notice, let's say I want to get from A to, we'll call this F. If I want to get from A to F, the only way to get there is to travel, well, we'll just call this B just for fun, travel to B and then to F. Now, if I were to create a cycle, now I could get to F by traveling straight down, we'll call that C, and then down again, we'll call that D, and then over to F. So from here, we can see this is no longer a tree because A, it's got a cycle, and B, there's more than one way to get to a particular vertex from another vertex. Now, if we happen to have more than one tree, just like in the real world, then we call this a forest. So we can see that this is the same graph that I have above. All I've done is I've taken away the segment that connects the two portions, and therefore this is called a forest because I have more than one tree. A special kind of tree is called a rooted tree, and a rooted tree is essentially when we designate one of our vertices to be the root. Um, so just for fun, let's use F to be our root. So if F was our root, then we would simply redraw the tree and notice that F is connected only to H. And we wouldn't have to put the arrows that we would typically do for a directed graph because a rooted tree is a directed graph. Notice I could put an arrow that connects F to H in that one direction, um, but typically we don't do that because it's implied based on a rooted tree. So we put the root at the top and then that connects to H. H connects to three vertices and that is to G, I, and A. Oops, I should leave room. And G doesn't connect to anything. I doesn't connect to anything, but A then would connect to B, and B connects to C and D, and D connects to E. So this is how I would draw the existing graph, the existing tree as a rooted tree with F as the root. And again, it's not necessary for you to put those arrows in there um, because they are implied because it is a rooted tree. I want to take you through some terminology related to rooted trees. And we're going to sort of skip around. I'm going to start here in the middle um, talking about relationships among vertices. So the good news is if you're familiar with the English language, you already know what these words mean when it comes to families and they're the same meaning when it comes to vertices. For instance, a parent would be a vertex like A that has children. So B and C are A's children. So A is a parent and B and C are children. Um, whereas for instance, E is a parent and has I as a child but obviously E is also a child of B, just like in real normal families. Siblings would be two children of the same parent, so in this case B and C would be considered siblings. Ancestor would be obviously a parent or grandparent or great-grandparent in real life, uh, and that's exactly what it is here on our graph. So if I was looking at E, I would say ancestors of E would include B and A, whereas descendants of E would be just the child, I. So again, ancestors are essentially above that particular vertex and descendants are directly related and below. So for instance, for E, I could not call J 
a descendant, even though it is below E, it's not directly connected to E. So I would be the only descendant of E. So that's all the family stuff. So we got all of those taken care of. Now let's talk about leaves. When you're looking at a graph, your vertices must either be a leaf or an internal vertex. An internal vertex just means that it has children. So in our particular graph, A and B and C and G and F and E and D, all of those would be considered internal vertices, whereas leaves would be anything that does not have children. So in this case, that would be H and I and J and K. So we've talked about both of those. Um, a pendant. A pendant is a vertex with a degree of one. And we're gonna talk more about that in a little bit. But for instance, if I looked at H or I or J or K, those all have degree one, which happen to be leaves here. But for instance, if I look at C, C has a degree of two because it's connected to both A and G. So C would not be considered a pendant. Um, let's pop back to the top before we talk about a subtree. So let's talk about a binary tree or an m -ary tree. When we're talking about an m -ary tree, M is going to be replaced with a number. So if you'll look at the degree of each of our, um, I'm sorry, not the degree really, we're looking at how many descendants, how many children each vertex has. So A has two children, B has three children, C has one child, and so on and so forth. So when we're talking about an m airy tree, this would be considered a three airy tree because each uh, vertex has at most three children. If it's a full m -ary tree, that would mean that each vertex has exactly three children. So obviously this is not a full three -ary tree. Now I could create what we call a full binary tree. A full binary tree would mean that each vertex that has children has exactly two children. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G. This would be considered a full binary tree. Binary, of course, by means two. So it's a two airy tree. And this would be considered a full uh, binary tree because each vertex, each internal vertex has exactly two children. So the last one is a subtree. And a subtree is essentially a tree that is created um, by, it's kind of like our induced subgraphs of our previous lessons. If I want to look at, say, a subtree of C, then it would just be C and G and K. So it would start with C as the root node and then any descendants of C. I want to talk just a bit about some of the properties of trees, but I do want to point out to you that I'm not going to go through all of the um, vertex math, we call it, that goes along with a full emery tree. Uh, I just don't feel it's important for our study in this course. Um, I did cover that material in Discrete Math 1 in that playlist, uh, video number 80. But let's just talk real quick about the number of edges versus the number of vertices. This should be fairly straightforward. I've created a little table for you uh, just so that you can see. But basically, however many vertices we have, we're going to have one fewer edge. And that makes sense because we know we can't have any cycles or loops. So we need just one distinct path from each vertex to each other, to another vertex. So for instance, if I have just one node, I don't have any edges because I can't connect a node or vertex to itself. If I have two vertices, there's just one way to connect those two. And if I have three vertices, then there's only two edges that I can possibly create. So again, 
it's pretty straightforward that whatever number we have for V, the number we have for E or the cardinality of the set of edges will be one less than that. So we can either say that the cardinality of V is equal to the cardinality of the edges plus one, because obviously the edges is less by one, so we would have to add one. Or we can say in order to get the number of edges, we would take the number of vertices and subtract one. Let's do just a bit of tree math. So what I mean is let's take a look at what we know about what we just talked about with the number of edges, sorry, the number of vertices being equal to the number of edges plus one, or the number of edges being equal to the number of vertices minus one. So we have two separate trees, T1 and T2, and for our first tree, the number of edges is 11. And for our second tree, the number of vertices is two times the number of vertices in the first tree. And essentially, we're trying to find anything that's missing, which is the number of vertices in our first tree, in our second tree, and the number of edges in our second tree. And the only thing that we're given here is that E1 is equal to 11. So obviously, if I'm trying to find V1, then it stands to reason I could take E1 plus 1, which would be 11 plus 1, or 12. So now I have the number of vertices in my first tree, and I can use that to now find the number of vertices in my second tree. So if V2 is equal to 2 times the number of vertices in my first tree, that's 2 times 12, or 24. So my second tree has 24 vertices. How many edges does it have? Well, again, the number of edges in E2 is going to be the number of vertices in V2 minus 1, which would be 24 minus 1, or 23. And again, you're certainly welcome to draw any of those out that you'd like, uh, but it's not necessary. We will be skipping section 11.2, Applications of Trees. Feel free to give that a read. Uh, there's really nothing in there that I could cover that you can't just read on your own. And section 11.3 about tree traversals, we're not going to cover that either. We're gonna go straight to 11.4, Spanning Trees with a Depth First Search.